We often hear the term self-compassion or hear somebody say to us, you need to have more self-compassion. But what does that term actually mean and how do we do it? I got asked that question recently by a subscriber. And so that's exactly what we're discussing in this video. I'm Jo Banks. I've been a professional executive business coach for 15 years and I'm sharing what I know. Understanding self-compassion. In essence, self-compassion involves treating ourselves with the same kindness and understanding that we'd readily give to others, especially in times of struggle. For many of us, especially those of us who grew up in challenging environments where self-compassion wasn't modelled or where our caregivers were either preoccupied or emotionally immature, Not knowing how to give ourselves compassion can have a profound impact on both our physical and mental health. Dr. Kristin Neff, a pioneering researcher in the field, defines self-compassion as having three components, self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. Number one, self-kindness. Self-kindness involves treating ourselves with warmth and understanding rather than harsh self-judgment. It's about acknowledging our flaws, mistakes and imperfections with the same compassion we'd offer to others, especially when our destructive inner critic raises its ugly head. Instead of berating ourselves for falling short of expectations, Self-kindness encourages a nurturing and supportive internal dialogue. Number two, common humanity. Recognising our shared human experience is central to self-compassion. It's an understanding that everybody encounters difficulties, failures and challenges. Unfortunately, if we haven't learnt the essential skill of self-compassion and continually berate ourselves when anything goes wrong, we can end up living in a heightened, hypervigilant state of perpetual fight, flight, freeze. The stress response that I've talked about in so many of my videos. When this happens, our prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain responsible for critical thinking, decision making, that shuts down. So we're not able to see things as they really are, but as we are, meaning our emotional state. Our amygdala, which is at the base of the brain here, which is responsible for spontaneous action and heightened emotions, literally hijacks this prefrontal cortex. It hijacks our ability to think critically. And so it makes us believe that we're the only ones who've ever experienced it so bad and that others can't possibly understand what we're going through. But that's simply not true. By acknowledging this, we can connect with the human experience, realising that we're not alone in our struggles. This shared perspective fosters empathy and diminishes feelings of isolation. There are countless studies that have proven the positive effects of social interaction with other empathetic people. After all, we are social creatures. Survival of the human race has depended for millennia on our ability to be able to live in groups and support each other. Social bonding, Empathy, support and caring are not nice to haves. They are critical to making us feel safe and secure, both physically and mentally. When we share our worries with others, friends, family members, coaches and therapists and other caring individuals, it really helps us regulate our nervous system. When we're around other people, we release oxytocin, the bonding chemical that makes us feel safe. Unfortunately, nowadays, many of us tend to self-isolate when we're going through tough times. We don't want to be a burden or be perceived as being weak. And so we do the exact opposite of what we need to do and what our ancestors have always done to keep themselves physically and psychologically safe. Number three, mindfulness. 
Mindfulness is a key component of self-compassion. It involves being present and aware of our thoughts and our emotions without judgment. It's about approaching our experiences with an open and non-reactive mind. Mindfulness allows us to observe our thoughts and feelings without becoming entangled in negative self-talk or destructive patterns, creating space for self-compassion to flourish. Strategies for cultivating self-compassion. The practice of self-compassion has a profound impact on mental health, contributing to overall well-being and resilience. Research indicates that individuals who cultivate self-compassion are more likely to experience lower levels of anxiety, depression and stress. Following are some of the ways in which self-compassion influences mental health. I've covered some of the following items in a previous video, number 41, five simple, easy to use science back tools to build mental toughness and manage stress. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. I'm going to leave that link below and really suggest you go and have a look at that video after this one. The basics. I've talked about the basics in a number of my videos, but I can't stress enough just how important these things are. Sleep, food, water, daylight, exercise. These are the fundamentals for all of us, regardless of what you're going through. If you're not taking care of the basics, everything will always seem worse. Remember, we are animals and we still have those basic fundamental needs to be able to function and move forward in the world. Mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness meditation is a powerful tool for cultivating that self-compassion. Set aside time each day to engage in mindfulness practices such as focused breathing, body scans or basic meditation. I've meditated on and off for years and as I have a very overactive mind that's very prone to worry, I would always struggle. I would feel like I wasn't doing it right because my mind would always wander and I'd struggle to stay focused on my breathing. I'm quite the perfectionist. I'd get really upset with myself because I thought I wasn't getting it right. It turns out after listening to a podcast with Dr. Rangan Chatterjee and a Buddhist monk, that I was doing it right all along. Apparently, guiding your thoughts back to your breathing whenever your mind wanders, which it will, it's always going to do, that in itself is the meditation. Meditation can help you become more aware of your thoughts and your emotions without judgment, laying the foundation for self-compassionate responses. I also use self-hypnosis frequently. I find that really useful. Two of my favourites, if you're interested in that, are Paul McKenna and Andrew Johnson. Andrew has lots of different apps. Again, I discuss this and NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, in more detail in the previous video I mentioned earlier. Challenging negative self-talk and your inner critic. This is a huge one and probably needs its own dedicated video, if I'm honest. When I first started my self-help, self-development journey, the first book I ever read on the topic was Paul McKenna's Change Your Life in Seven Days. And it did just that. It literally changed my life in seven days. Now, I haven't read that book for years. And although it's probably over 20 years old now, I still reckon it's valid today and definitely worth a look if you haven't read it and struggled with the things that I discuss frequently on my channel. The first thing I remember about that book that completely blew my mind was the section on critical self-talk. Really listening to your inner critic. It may seem fundamental now, but 20 years ago, that was groundbreaking and I hadn't heard of that concept before. When I tuned into mine, what I was saying was vile. From the moment I was getting up in the morning to going to bed at night, I would say the most horrendous, hurtful, hateful things to myself. To be honest, because I didn't have any other references, I thought that was normal. And if you think that's normal and everyone else does it, nope, no, they don't. Many of us can have a critical voice when we've done something wrong or that we don't like or that we're annoyed at ourselves for doing. 
But this was on a whole other level. Obviously, over the last 20 years, I've really studied this. I study anything that bewilders me and that I come across that I think might be able to help me. What I've learned is that if you have a particularly strong inner critic, it's likely a continuation of bullying you experienced as a child or behaviours modelled in your childhood home. If we grew up in a particularly critical or even bullying household, the voices of our bullies often become our adult inner critic, that critical internal voice. Now, I'd love to say there's a quick fix to managing your inner critic. Sadly not. Although it's relatively simple to change, it often takes time to build up the new neural connections to replace the old ones used by the inner critic. Even now, if I'm at a low ebb and haven't been taking care of myself, one of the reminders of that is that I revert to negative self-talk. And that's what we call a flashback. So here's an exercise and some tools that I use that will help you change that critical inner voice. Firstly, tune into how you're talking to yourself. Are you being kind, loving, supportive or negative, mean, cruel, self-pitying? Incidentally, many of us talk to ourselves in a way that we'd never allow another person to do. So if you're being extremely negative and hurtful towards yourself, here are three ways to overcome it. Number one, as soon as you notice yourself saying something unkind, and as with most things, this starts with awareness, stop and deliberately say something that's the opposite reframe your thoughts with kindness and understanding. Talk to yourself as you would a close friend, offering words of encouragement and support. Number two, this is some NLP. Change the pitch, tone, pace of your voice. I like using a whiny teenager's voice or a distinctive one like Donald Duck's. Doing that takes the scariness out of it and will likely make you laugh. Third one, stick out your thumb and in your mind, move the voice to the end of the thumb. It sounds really weird, but when you dissociate from the voice and project it outwards, it dilutes the power and makes you realise that actually it's you saying those words. They're not true. It's just this ridiculous voice that you've created in your head. Each one of those things is really easy to do and you can do them anytime. The hardest part is remembering to do them, especially if you're in that downward negative spiral. Practice self-kindness. Integrate self-kindness into your daily routine. Treat yourself with the same care as you would a child or a friend or a family member. This may involve taking breaks when you need to, prioritising self-care activities and avoiding self-imposed perfectionism. Small acts of self-kindness can accumulate, contributing to a more compassionate overall mindset. Many people feel guilty for taking time for themselves. If that's you, Remember, you cannot pour from an empty cup, even if you just do some self-care for 10 minutes a day. And I call that the 10 minute happiness challenge. Over time, that will compound and contribute to making a difference to your overall well-being. Journaling. Again, I have discussed this so many times in lots of my different videos. There are so many proven psychological benefits of journaling. So I'm not going to go into the detail here. However, journaling can be a valuable tool for self-reflection and cultivating self-compassion. Write about your experiences, acknowledging both the challenges and the successes. Explore your feelings with a compassionate perspective, recognising that imperfection is a shared aspect of that human experience that we were talking about earlier. Instead of striving for perfection, strive for excellence. I love this saying, no one can be perfect, but every one of us can be excellent. The wrap up. In the journey of self-discovery and personal growth, self-compassion can really help you navigate life's challenges. By understanding and incorporating the principles of self-kindness, 
common humanity and mindfulness, you can nurture your soul, fostering a compassionate relationship with yourself. As research continues to underscore the transformative power of self-compassion, integrating these strategies into daily life becomes not just a choice, but a vital step towards a more fulfilling and emotionally resilient existence. What next? If you have any words of wisdom on this topic or you have any questions you'd like me to answer, please leave them in the comments section below. I really love interacting with you all and I love getting your feedback. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a thing. I'm also trying to get to a thousand subscribers so that I can finally start doing live streaming live streaming. So if you could help with that, I'd be so grateful. Finally, 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 as always, a huge thank you to everybody who stays until the very end. And thank you so much for your support. It really does mean the world to me.